views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. I'm pleased to welcome today's guest, Deanne Criswell, Commissioner of the New York City Apart Emergency Management Department. She oversees the city's efforts to plan and prepare for emergencies, educate the public about preparedness, coordinate emergency response and recovery, and disseminate emergency information. She's managed the city's response to extreme summer heat, large fires, and power outages. She's previously held senior roles at FEMA in private sector homeland security work also served at the Colorado Air National Guard. Our next guest, New York City Council Member Donovan Richards, Chair of the Public Safety Committee. He's a lifelong resident of Southeast Queens, the Rockaways, a two-term member of the City Council, and now leading candidate for Queensborough President. He previously chaired the Environmental Protection Committee, playing a role in the response to Superstorm Sandy. And he's now Chair of the Public Safety Committee at a time when advocates and advocates and activists have made progress in reforming the criminal justice system our next guest, FDNY First Deputy Commissioner, Laura Kavanaugh. She's the second highest ranking civilian administrator in the fire department, managing day-to-day -day operations and, and activities of the FDNY across all offices and bureaus. In various roles at FDNY, she has coordinated with other government agencies, elected officials, and community organizations. She has overseen critical care and needs of families of FDNY members killed in the line of duty, as well as those battling World Trade Center related illnesses. And she's overseen the implementation of fire and EMS call taking operations at the city's new state of the art emergency call center in the Bronx. She also played a key role in developing the emergency response to Ebola in the city. And that's provided a starting point for the response to our latest epidemic. Finally, Tiffany Chapman, she's a manager of mitigation at the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey's Office of Emergency Management. A former banking executive, she's also an adjunct professor at MCNY or Metropolitan College of New York. And today she'll be speaking from her role at MCNY and broadly as a disaster recovery specialist and an expert on emergency response. Uh, but before we begin, a few quick things. Uh, first, a word from our sponsors today, Metropolitan College of New York and CDW. Metropolitan College of New York is a nonprofit purpose-centered college committed to community and social justice. With two campuses, downtown in the Financial District and in the Bronx, MCNY offers undergraduate and graduate programs that give students the tools to make a positive difference in their lives, workplaces, and community. And thanks to our sponsor, CDW. As the coronavirus situation continues to evolve, we know it presents extraordinary obstacles. Our focus is on helping our customers navigate a rapidly changing environment while ensuring the safety and well being of our coworkers, communities, and suppliers. Now, there are a few functions I'll point out for the audience on Zoom. To ask a question, uh, there's a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Select that and uh, write in your question. I'll take a few of those at the end as time permits. You can also interact with each other on the chat function at the bottom of your screen. Uh, please use the drop-down box to share your comments with all attendees, not just the panelists. Uh, please keep it civil and on point. Again, if you want to ask a question, use a Q&A function. That's the best place to process those. Uh, you can also change the view settings in the top right-hand corner of your screen. Uh, my first question for the panel as a whole, as briefly as you can, what spe specifically have you been doing in terms of the emergency response to the coronavirus pandemic? Uh, and uh, council member, we'll start with you. Well, great. Thank you. Thank you for having me, John. And, and certainly I'm proud to be on this panel with such distinguished guests. Uh, first, I hope everyone is staying safe and practicing social distancing. Um, so what have we been up to? It's been uh, a lot of work. And let me just speak about the immediate work that has needed to be done. And that is to ensure that food access um, was front and center. There are a lot of New Yorkers out there who are struggling, who can't pay their rent who don't know where their next mail is coming from because that check is not coming in. Uh, so uh, specifically for my district, 
uh, we've been uh, setting up and coordinating food deliveries uh, for all of my public housing developments. Also, our senior citizens who also have had a lot of challenges, many who attend senior centers who, that are currently closed, who don't know where their next meal is coming from. So we've largely been coordinating with uh, DIFTA, but also working with a lot of community-based organizations to get food into people's hands. Uh, and there's no, there's a whole myriad of different things. I mean, you talk about education, the need to ensure that our children who now are uh, participating in remote learning have access to the technology they need to move forward. You talk about the need for every community to have food access, kosher meals. Um, we've been working, I just held a hearing on domestic violence as the chairman of the Public Safety Committee to find creative ways that the NYPD should explore in ensuring that domestic violence victims uh, get the resources that they need during this period. Working with small business services to ensure that our small businesses are getting access to loans and grants. And there's a lot more work to do around that. I'm not necessarily happy with that. This week, we'll be also hosting a town hall tomorrow, on tomorrow actually, with the chairman of NYCHA uh, for public housing residents across Queens. But I represent the largest concentration of public housing in Queens. So we'll be working and, and talking and discussing ways to make sure NYCHA residents are getting their resources. Tell me when to stop because there's just so much to, 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 to go on. Uh, uh, and, that's good, uh, Council Member. Um, we'll, yeah. we'll touch on some of that in the, in the discussion. Um, but but there have been a lot of virtual town halls and a lot of virtual meetings. I can assure you that we're all working. <laughs> we're all we're all getting to be experts on Zoom. Um, uh, Commissioner Chriswell, uh, over to you. Okay, and we're not doing, we're not actually hearing you, uh, Commissioner. Um, we'll hold off a second. We'll see if we can resolve that. Um, and then I guess over to um, Laura Cavanaugh, uh, first Deputy Commissioner at the FDNY. Sure. Um, again, thanks for having us. Um, you know, I think it's important to remember about the New York City Fire Department that we are both um, a healthcare provider and we are a first responder agency. So in this particular emergency, um, we, and when I say we, I mean our members, our paramedics, EMTs, firefighters, um, have been on the front lines. They have been responding to these um, COVID calls for quite a few months now. Um, you know, they've done an extraordinary job, um, but they've been incredibly busy um, and been seeing, you know, a lot of the really, really hard parts of this emergency firsthand. So we've been incredibly busy um, responding to those calls, uh, as well as, you know, planning for right now and for the future as an agency. Sure, certainly. Uh, we'll hear more about that. Um, Commissioner Chris, well, if you can check on your chat function, I think we sent uh, a phone call in for you. Uh, so give that a try. We'll hop over to our fourth panelist, uh, Tiffany Chapman. And and you're on mute, uh, Tiffany. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, sorry about that. Um, thank you for having MCNY as part of the panel today. We really appreciate it. Uh, some of the things we've been doing as the pandemic has kind of unfolded with the school is we went to a remote learning environment where we took all of our in-person classes through them online, um, enhanced the online versions of our classes that we were already doing and tried to maintain as much contact with our students as we possibly could uh, to make sure that they were okay, to make sure that they had you know, access to resources, um, if any of them had lost their jobs or lost access to food or supplies or whatever, we tried to keep those channels open as well as our educational channels. So those are some of the things that we've undertaken at NCNY uh, in the midst of this pandemic. Sure, great. Uh, Commissioner Criswell, we'll, we'll try again, see if we work out the technical issue here. No, no, not hearing anything. Uh, we are gonna talk about tech uh, later in the discussion, by the way. Um, so we'll, we'll put that on hold for now. Um, and we'll, we'll come back to the commissioner as soon as we resolve this. Um, wanted to pose a, a question to panel Hall as well. Um, what preparation had been done in New York City and state uh, for this kind of threat, this coronavirus threat specifically? Um, how well were we prepared? Uh, and, and Council Member, let's start with you on that. And, and you're on mute, Council Member. Uh, 
I'll stop muting myself. Um, so let me just start with, um, there are a lot of lessons to be learned here. And I think the, the first lesson is that uh, in order to address a pandemic of this nature, we have to address the inequalities that certainly continue to exist uh, in communities, black and brown communities specifically, who have been the hardest hit uh, during uh, this corona COVID-19 crisis. Uh, if we are not addressing these is issues uh, prior to a pandemic, we will be here. You know, there's a lot of conversations around when will this pandemic end? And I'm afraid to say that this pandemic will end no time soon uh, for many of our communities uh, because of the inequities that uh, have existed. Hurricane Sandy certainly was a gave us a lot of uh, lessons. And those lessons, some, I will say for the, for the de Blasio administration, uh, some things have been good, but there's specifically a lot of issues uh, around transparency that I was concerned about uh, when you talk about data and looking at who has been impacted. The administration finally released what and where uh, people were being impacted by COVID um, uh, were at. Uh, uh, certainly, and that, that is critical. Data was something that was missing very early on. And then just to talk about the response period, I meant there was no concentrated effort uh, to ensure that there were resources on the ground. We needed a lot more coordination around city agencies and what was happening on the ground. But one of the reasons my community was blessed is because we did go through through Hurricane Sandy. So a lot of our local community-based organizations knew where we needed to go, how we needed to respond. Um, so I would say there's a lot of learning lessons that, that we have to take moving from here. I'm hoping that we strengthen our systems in healthcare, uh, that we look at housing and rental assistance. But these are the things that were impacting many communities prior to COVID-19 hitting. And now the world gets to see, once again, just as Sandy did, that when black and brown communities get, uh, when America catches a cold, black and brown communities catch pneumonia, and in this case, COVID-19. So there's a lot of work to be done around inequities, um, but I will say that the administration has certainly taken some good steps over the course of the last few weeks to fill in a lot of the gaps. Sure. Uh, Laura, over to you. Uh, sure. I would echo what the council member said. You know, healthcare delivery is something we're very passionate about. Um, and so we look forward to working with him on that um, following this emergency or during it, you know, depending on how we look on at how long this is going to go on for. Uh, in terms of preparation, you know, as you had mentioned uh, in the beginning, the fire department has been at the forefront of some other infectious diseases, most recently Ebola. And so there is a lot of uh, lessons that we learned, a lot of um, training that we went through that really, you know, prepared us well to confront Ebola and prepared us well to confront this. Uh, and I think those lessons are around, you know, training, equipment. Um, they're also around the 911 system. And so early in this emergency, actually in January, we began uh, triaging in the 911 system at emergency medical dispatch. We began screening for COVID calls so that we would know before our members even arrived whether or not someone was likely COVID. Um, and so that, that's a protocol and a, a technology, which I will get to uh, later in this talk. But that's something that we were able to utilize uh, in the past that we were able to utilize here so that our members could know what they were going into. And so we had some insight uh, early on into how many of these calls we were getting and how many cases um, that might be. So I think, uh, as the council member also alluded to, you know, I think the, the real challenge here is going to be how long this goes on for. Um, we may be through the first wave, but this is by no means over. Uh, and that's, that's a very new challenge for everyone. It's a challenge for the city, um, but it's also a challenge for the country and the world, frankly. So I think we still have, you know, a lot to prepare for. But I think in terms of the early stages, you know, the fire department did have some experience uh, in what this is like in the beginning. Sure. Uh, Commissioner Criswell. Can you hear me? Oh, now we hear you. Great. Okay. It looks like I was muted for the host. Um, so let me go back to the first question, which was on the response and 
talk a little bit about the main lines of effort that we have been doing here at Emergency Management. Um, our first focus was on hospital infrastructure. I just lost the call. No, we're still here. Can we're, you guys we're still good. hear me? Yep. Unbelievable. No, we're, we're, we're good. We can hear you. Can you we're, hear me? Yep. I can't hear you at all. Okay, so if you can hear me, then um, I'll, I'll keep talking. Um, our first focus was on hospital infrastructure, which was about staff space and stuff, making sure that we had enough space for the potential number of patients that we were going to see. Uh, we had some very high planning assumptions very early on in this event um, based on uh, perhaps lack of social distancing, and then what would be the number of staff that we would need to support that as well as the stuff, and that would be the equipment, the ventilators, the PPE that we would need to be able to ensure that our hospital system would not collapse. Um, one of the other items that we focused on was then also isolation hotels and how do we find and provide a safe place for people to isolate that are COVID positive, um, especially our healthcare workers or our families that live in very dense households. And so they didn't expose other people. And that's a program that's still going and expanding today. Um, and then finally, um, you know, as this, as we've seen this progress, focused on fatality management and how do we make sure that we provide a dignified way of taking care of our loved ones that um, eventually succumb to this virus. You know, other pieces that we have supported through this as well is we now have a very uh, new vulnerable population and how do we make sure that we're taking care of those people that have um, perhaps a lack of income. I think as the council member had talked about feeding those um, vulnerable New Yorkers and providing food service. We have gone over 3 million meals out to vulnerable New Yorkers um, wow. that um, have identified, self-identified as being vulnerable from COVID. That does not include the meals that we've given to our schools or the, the meals that we've given through normal programs. That was above and beyond that, which is, is pretty amazing, the amount of people that we've been able to reach out to. And I think um, I'll just stop right there and go into the, so we can go into the next. Sure, sure. Uh, Tiffany, over to you. Anything to add? Um, as far as the preparation goes, we already had the, uh, the technological infrastructure because of our online division uh, for the classes. And then we had already put into place some of our social programs, um, helping the students uh, with food and other materials supplies. Um, so a lot of those were just enhanced as we moved into the pandemic. So we, we were lucky that we already had some of those programs uh, going. Sure, sure. Um, and then following up on a, a point made earlier, um, you know, this is not ending anytime soon. Um, really, any of you, you want to answer, what are you planning for in the next few months, in the next six months, the next year, the next 18 months? You know, it, it, we really got to look ahead now, right? And um, I guess uh, Commissioner Criswell, if, if you want to start. Yeah, that would be great. I think one of the things that we're really focused on right now is this transition from response into a recovery operation and what does recovery look like at many different levels. But for us specifically, how do we help New Yorkers recover while at the same time preparing for heat season and coastal storm season? And what types of changes do we need to make to our existing plans to adapt them in this new environment of social distancing, um, and the COVID-19 realities. And so we're doing a lot of what we're calling cascading impact planning and looking at all of our existing work that we've done and what do we need to adapt and adjust and how are we gonna be able to better prepare New Yorkers while they're recovering from this and then as well as getting ready for the next potential event. Sure, and, and to follow up on that, well, one thing we've been looking to is cooling centers. I, I think the Comptroller Scott Stringer put out a report on this. Um, you know, for senior citizens, it's going to be a hot summer again. Um, what can the city do on that front? Or, or what are the things we're, we're concerned So we're looking at a number of different things that we can do to prepare New Yorkers for the heat season. Um, we're looking at how do we modify our existing cooling center strategy, but also how do we use non-traditional -tradition, cooling um, 
possibilities, right? Can we do non-congregate cooling capability, maybe through our isolation hotels, maybe through other means? Um, how do we provide or increase in-home cooling for those that are vulnerable? You know, what we know right now is those that are the most vulnerable to heat are also those that are the most vulnerable to COVID. And so trying to protect that population as much as we can and if we're still in an environment where the um, decline hasn't started to happen and we still have this New York pause or very strict social distancing, we're going to have to come up with other ways to provide relief to those that are the most vulnerable. Sure. Um, Council member, anything to add? Yeah, I would just say, I mean, Sandy certainly taught us a lot of lessons. I, I like the idea of um, because it's going to be very complicated to do cooling centers, right? When you think about um, public housing residents who may be stuck in their developments, there's no way in their centers may provide limitations on how to social distance because the centers may be too small. The strategy really has to move towards an, an um, in-house cooling strategy, right? I mean, how do we purchase air conditions for the most vulnerable. And I think the city's budget uh, will certainly be uh, a measure of, of what are we looking to prioritize in this budget. So I think we have to look out for our most vulnerable, but certainly it's going to have to move to an in-house strategy. Uh, Laura, I think, uh, I guess going back to the, the question, um, sort of, you know, three months, six months, a year ahead, what, what are you looking at? Yes, so I think there's two parts. You know, operationally, as I mentioned before, we're looking at the data and following the data closely, particularly data that comes in through the 911 system, trying to um, see what the trends are going to be, see early whether or not we're seeing another peak, um, and preparing for that. You know, stockpiling PPE, looking at all our protocols and procedures, and trying to find out early, um, you know, whether or not we'll be facing another wave and, and what would that would look like and to make sure we're prepared um, for that next outbreak. Internally, we're thinking a lot about um, our membership and how we can ensure their physical and mental safety throughout this. You know, they've, they've seen a lot, um, a lot of death, frankly, and that takes a real toll. Um, they work incredibly long hours through the peak of this. And so we need to make sure that we're taking care of them and their families at the same time that we're ramping up operations and preparing for a wave or, or many waves um, and with, you know, with some uncertainty on how long this will go on for. So we have two parallel tracks, um, both operationally and internally, where we're looking at both our operations and our membership and making sure we're prepared um, for every eventuality in this emergency. Mm -hmm. And we've touched on this uh, already in the discussion, but looking at past uh, emergencies, past disasters in New York, um, what what is really applicable across all of them? How much of it do you just kind of have to toss out the window and start from scratch? This is a very different kind of emergency uh, than some of the others. But you know, I think Council Member, you mentioned uh, Superstorm Sandy, obviously 9/11, uh, other kinds of emergencies. Again, what are some of the specific things that apply? Uh, you know, first Deputy Commissioner, you talked about Ebola. What, what are some specific things that apply that we learned that we're doing well? And, and what are we kind of having to figure out on the fly here? Uh, and I guess Commissioner Criswell, if, if we could start with you. Well, I think that as we've seen this virus evolve, we've learned a lot along the way, and we've been able to adapt our response as we have learned more each and every day um, with this virus. And, you know, I talked about the canning and what we're going to be able to do or have to do in order to prepare for the next natural hazard that might come up, but we're also preparing for what we might see as a next wave of the pandemic and adapting and um, implying all of the different lessons learned throughout this process. And when we're looking at the cascading impacts piece of it, then I, I think that a lot of our plans are good and what we have in place is where we need to start. It's a matter of how do we do it in a new environment now and how do we do it with this new normal of trying to keep our most vulnerable population safe through social distancing, through the use of proper PPE, 
um, maybe our triggers have to be a little bit sooner to make decisions because it's going to take us longer to do the preparatory, uh, preparatory work, say an evacuation, maybe we have to do that sooner. So those are all the different pieces that we're looking at right now so we can be better prepared to do this in this different environment. Sure. Uh, Tiffany, over to you. So we're looking down the road at, um, you know, throwing all of our classes online and then looking at how our curriculum changes. Um, the school was, has dealt with Superstorm Sandy. We were closed for several weeks after that storm. Um, but now we have to make, <clears throat> excuse me, new plans and new, um, new changes to curriculum, new changes to processes. Um, so those are the kinds of things that we're looking at for the school. This also gives us an opportunity to look at um, the existing curriculum. Um, so what have we been taught, you know, teaching with public health or uh, disaster mental health? And now how does the current situation change all of that? And how is it all evolving in real time? And it really gives our students a great opportunity to see all of those different things working together. Sure. And then first Deputy Commissioner, you, you mentioned um, the preparation for Ebola in New York and, and how that uh, paved the way for some of the response here. Uh, if you could elaborate on that, I, I didn't know so much about that. Sure. I, I think I would say that, you know, adaptability is the key word here. And most of our operational foundation is on that basis that we can never plan exactly for how an emergency will unfold. But a lot of the training that we do can be uh, applicable to a new type of emergency. And so, you know, Ebola is one example where it, we had hazmat training that had originally been put together for a nuclear attack that was able to be adapted to a biological um, event. And so that, you know, that training in terms of decon procedures, in terms of PPE procedures that we put together for Ebola, that itself was adapted. Um, and then that was adapted again for COVID. Um, so I think that's, you know, essential to an emergency like this one where um, there is a lot of uncertainty and we're not sure how long this will go on for. Uh, is a lot of training and mental performance and making sure that the the equipment and training that you do uh, can be adapted to however the emergency unfolds. Sure, sure. Uh, council member? Yeah, and, and I would just add that, um, you know, moving forward, um, you know, I think food security certainly is something we're going to continue to watch uh, very closely. I think self-isolation strategies. I mean, a, a lot of people talk about self-isolating in a period, especially for residents who don't have that luxury, right? So I think a lot of strategies, uh, in particular around the hotels, and I know I've worked with a lot of the advocates and been one who said we need to open up 30,000 rooms at least to make sure that people can self-isolate, that we look at our homeless shelters. Internet access is another big one. Um, I think we are all moving towards, as, as we're on a Zoom call today, uh, we have to figure out creative ways moving into the future to make sure every New York City resident, especially low-income New Yorkers, have access to the Internet, but also that we're training them on uh, new ways of using um, Zoom and other virtual platforms as well. PPE, CBOs playing a much larger role, I think, is something that is critical. Um, and I know we all have to social distance. But I think that we have a lot more room to ensure that uh, people and validators on the ground uh, are there working collectively with city government uh, to bring resources to uh, areas that have been hit and especially those who have been hit the hardest. Sure. Um, and then council member, um, I know you, you've done a lot of work on resiliency uh, again, post Sandy and, and in your neighborhood. Um, some commentators have suggested that, that this epidemic, this crisis, is a is a dress rehearsal for climate change. Um, what's your thoughts on on that take? Well, I mean, I'm, I mean, we didn't have a dress rehearsal during Hurricane Sandy. I mean, <laughs> um, so it, it, it's it's you know, so in terms of climate change, uh, I don't think anything um, is that sporadically different here, except that we we've, we've lost. Um, thousands of people in our communities. I'm mourning people. I just lost another gr a good friend yesterday uh, to COVID-19. So it, there drastically are correlations. And the, the correlation is that you have to address the systematic inequities to address a pandemic, to address the inequalities that many communities face. 
Um, so whether that's um, phasing out the dirtiest oils that we use, whether that's moving to a renewable future, whether it's making sure that more food access in, is in place, making sure that everybody has internet access, making sure your healthcare system is actually one functioning for everyone in a healthcare system that is invested in heavily in every community. I mean, there is a there is no difference in um, what we're dealing with um, now than what we incurred during Sandy, uh, except the amount of deaths that we certainly have seen. So uh, very unfortunate, but a lot more work to be done. Sure, sure. Uh, just a reminder for the audience, uh, if you have any questions, uh, click the Q&A button at the bottom. You can also upvote. You can give a thumbs up to a question. If it gets enough, enough upvotes, it moves up to the top. Uh, it's a higher priority question for me to consider. Uh, wanted to then uh, go back to, there was some mention of, of technology and, and communication. Uh, I think two important uh, components here. Um, we're not really where we were at all in 1918 when the Spanish flu hit New York. Um, broadly, you know, what, what's different? What are the key different technological innovations uh, that are helping uh, this time around? Um, and I guess, Tiffany, we'll start with you. Sure. So from the academic standpoint, um, the fact that we can have online classes, we have online platforms um, to have education and uh, discussions and then Zoom calls like this so we can still have, you know, lectures and face-to-face -face interaction. So we're adapting certainly in the educational realm and moving things online. Um, and I think that's huge. So we don't all have to get together in a classroom setting. Um, the school also has like alert system. So to let everyone know, um, you know, the campus is going to be closed or where we are moving to an online environment. So all those different kinds of communication tools, uh, different messaging platforms to, to keep the students informed. Um, it's really been a godsend for the education world, and especially, you know, not just higher education, but lower education as well, as we see elementary schools and high schools and everyone moving to the online environment. And there, there are certainly some uh, learning curves for some people that aren't used to the online platforms, um, but it's really been beneficial, and the learning can continue with uh, the technology we have available to us. Sure. Uh, Commissioner Criswell? You know, in this environment, it's been a really interesting um, um, exercise in trying to figure out how we can get everybody to telework and something that the city hasn't necessarily done in a broad scale. And so technology has really played a part in helping us keep social distancing in the workspace by allowing people to work from home. And being able to put that together on the fly and educate people has been uh, it's been it's been interesting to see how the um, different generations can adapt to the different technology needs and able to support this. So that part itself on the technology and learning how we can do things differently going forward has been really, really good. I think the other part from the technology standpoint, too, has been just um, using technology to support our data needs and data visualization and how do we use artificial intelligence to help model um, where we're going with this so we can do better predictive analytics and help make decisions a little bit better. And so bringing in the data and the analytics uh, to help us make decisions has been a valuable part of this um, as well. Sure. And um, actually I actually wanted to ask uh, first to be the commissioner, um, a variation on this question. I ran across this piece from Fast Company just last month, how the telephone failed its big test during 1980, 1918 Spanish flu pandemic. So apparently at the time, everyone thought the phone was going to be the answer to the social distancing of the time. But in fact, as the story says, telephone operators were just as vulnerable to the Spanish flu as anyone else, even more so. They were sitting in switchboards and tight quarters. As their ranks were depleted by illness, at the same time, uh, the flu was increasing call volume. Um, I guess, what, what's kind of the modern analogy? Is there, is there a risk, even if you have the technology in place, you know, the people operating the technology, uh, some number of them are, are getting ill and, and have to be out of work? Yeah, so I think the fire department has, you know, a lot of really good experience in 
um, technology and utilizing it both as Commissioner Criswell said to make decisions um, and to understand where um, all the pieces of, of our operation are at any given moment. Um, but we also have a lot of experience, you know, being on the front lines, having to do the work in person, and there and there is no technology that can replace um, an EMT, a paramedic, or a firefighter doing that job. And so, you know, we're sort of an interesting hybrid. Um, at, at the 911 center, um, you know, technology is essential. We, as you know, had incredibly high call volume, um, and we have something called computerized triage, and that helps us assess um, through using a computer and data to understand how sick are people, what category do they fall in, and that helps us, you know, our operators, not only make decisions about what resources can be assigned, but it also helps us make decisions at an executive level about you know, what we're seeing in terms of how this disease is progressing, how many people are sick with it, and we can share that information with, with OEM and others. Um, so, you know, on one hand, technology is essential to us and how we plan, how we make decisions. It certainly underlies the 911 system and is essential to running that operation. Um, but we also know how, you know, that there is no technology that replaces certain certain jobs. And certainly, you know, the, the main work that we do here is one of those examples. Sure. And that's just uh, something that, that uh, crossed our radar in the last 24 hours, uh, line of duty benefits. Um, typically, you know, uh, traditional law enforcement or fire um, positions, if you're killed in the line of duty, you get some kind of public benefit from that. Um, this time around, it, it seems like how do you actually even tell if someone got sick when they were on the job? Um, and there might be a, an argument to be made that this kind of benefit should be extended to, say, MTA workers, people that have to keep working. They're on the so-called front lines. Uh, any thoughts about how we address that issue going forward? Sure. So I think this is an incredibly important issue. I think you might have seen in the past few days our commissioner has um, spoken out about you know, the importance of ensuring that our members get and their families get the benefits um, that they really need uh, and that they deserve from doing this frontline work, from having to show up every day um, when everybody else is, for the most part, at home. Um, so, you know, what does it take? Um, it does take uh, cooperation from our state and federal partners. Um, mm -hmm. That is not a decision that the fire department can make, unfortunately. Um, we did meet with uh, Council Member Borelli on Friday, who does have some legislation on this end, um, but that would change uh, the way benefits are, are given by the state. And that, that would be the most essential piece of ensuring that um, EMT is paramedics and firefighters were to receive those benefits. Anyone else on that? Yeah, and I, I would just agree. I, I mean, I think this is a question as uh, Washington also looks at another stimulus package. These are all things that I think can can be addressed. Uh, similar to 9-11, right? Um, you know, it's taken a long time to address that fight even through 9-11. So this is a question of uh, budget priorities and do we value the essential workers who really are putting their lives on the front lines uh, every day for, for every New Yorker and, and, and certainly other states around the country. And then Council Member, I, I think you mentioned earlier um, the risk of budget cuts, uh, you know, what with the uh, economic slowdown, uh, the, the lack of um, federal aid for states and, and municipalities, at least so far. Um, is there really a, a risk um, that there wouldn't be enough resources for emergency response in New York City, in New York State, or is that an area where politically and, and financially there's going to be the money? Everyone, everyone's going to get behind this and um, you know, provide what's needed. What, what are your thoughts on that front? So let me just start with, we are facing billions of dollars worth of cuts right here in New York City. And I'm certainly uh, supporting both the governor and the mayor in their call for Washington to get it right for New York City. I mean, you're talking about jumpstarting an economy. You're talking about uh, the va value valuing essential workers. And we need that money. I'm very happy we're very closely with Congressman Gregory Meeks. I'm missing a conference call today, partly because we're doing this today. We do conference calls every day. Um, but the congressional delegation certainly is putting together and working very hard to push a package uh, for our entire state. And we're going to continue to to work very closely with them in whatever ways we can to ensure that, that they have the support they need to bring this next um, stimulus package or CARES Act into play here. But state and local governments absolutely need 
resources from the federal government. We can't get out of this hole without them. Uh, and we can see much more substantial cuts if we don't get that support from Washington, D.C. And then, Council Member, I'll ask you another quick question from, from the audience. Um, does the council plan on introducing any health and safety related legislation for workplaces? Well, there was a package uh, introduced last week uh, for essential workers, for them to certainly get uh, much more resources during this time of, of the pandemic. So um, we're looking at that bill very closely. I believe Carlina Rivera has introduced that bill and she has a few other bills that she's looking at. Uh, I mean, my, in my role as chairman of public safety in the NYPD, we'll be certainly looking at um, resources and how we're stockpiling PPE as we move forward. But absolutely, the council is looking at ways. And, and I'm also looking just from a small business perspective as well on how are resources being delved out across the city. I think last I, I read Friday, uh, 9% of all loans and grants went to Queens, nearly 56% of those resources went to Manhattan. So we want uh, a recovery that benefits not just Manhattan, but the outer boroughs as well. And we're gonna be watching these things very closely, but I can assure you we're looking at packages and I know the speaker is looking very closely at this issue. Sure. Uh, another audience question that came in, um, any plans to act more proactively to keep people in, uh, from congregate, sorry, in congregated settings safe, especially those who are medically vulnerable? And I'll add, um, I, I think probably most of you have seen the photos of the people out in droves over the weekend in New York City's green spaces, uh, blew up on social media. Um, are people taking this seriously? Uh, how do you address compliance? I mean, I guess arresting people, maybe that's not an effective answer either. Uh, any thoughts on that? Oh, okay. I, I guess I could answer that. I was talking about that a little uh, earlier on the Brian Lehrer show. And the question is, can you arrest your way out of a pandemic? And when you look at the inequities around the criminalization of communities of color, um, the lack of resources, uh, I, I don't see how, how that works. So we really do need um, to look at community-based solutions. And that means working with uh, crisis management organizations, uh, working with validators, local clergy members, um, in local communities to address these issues on the front line. Uh, people, uh, people in the communities actually know and, and respect. They're not saying that they don't respect the police department, but when you come in with a law enforcement heavy solution, that is not the answer. First of all, even if you wanted to send people to Rikers Island right now, uh, people on Rikers Island got COVID. Our corrections officers have COVID. So what are we really accomplishing during this moment when we're talking about cutting billions of dollars out of the budget and then incarcerating people? So I think we have to look at community-based solutions. I think we, we have to do a lot more testing, and I'm finally happy the mayor and the governor are certainly talking that up a lot more because testing and tracking um, will be critical and key in ensuring that we actually get out of this pandemic. Sure. Any additional thoughts on compliance from any of the other panelists, whether it's social distancing or other aspects of compliance in an emergency response? I think I'd agree with the council member that testing is essential and, and we're really happy to see that as well. Um, and that, you know, we also believe that public education is essential here um, because, you know, we have to remember this is a, an essentially human emergency, right? People are losing friends and family um, and coworkers in many cases. And so, you know, that's what we ask people to remember is that, you know, if, if they're going out and they're not socially distancing or they're not wearing a mask, you know, it's our members that they're putting at risk and their friends and family that they're putting at risk because our, our people have to come to work um, and they especially have to come to work if there's another resurgence of this. Uh, and so I think that that messaging is, is the most effective way to get people to stay home is to remember the human aspect of this, that there really are lives on the line and there are a lot of people, um, including the FDNY members who can't stay home, that don't have that choice. Sure. Um, a couple other questions from the audience. Um, two questions about isolation hotels. Um, uh, for Commissioner Criswell, I know there are a number of unfortunate deaths in the OEM isolation hotels a few weeks ago. Can you speak more to how OEM is improving hotel operations to make sure that people who go there to isolate get the appropriate care and monitoring they need? 
Yes, definitely. So to start out, the isolation hotels that we had in place or we have in place um, are designed to support people that are not symptomatic and not sick, but had um, tested positive for COVID and put them in a place that they can keep their family safe or their coworkers safe while they um, go through their uh, 14 day period. But what we have found with this um, virus is that people can get worse really fast. And so the things that we have done to make sure that we are improving um, the level of care that is being provided there is one is, is patients are being discharged from hospitals. Um, we have a stricter screening to make sure that they're actually ready to go into this uh, type of a setting versus um, staying in the hospital. Um, but we've also brought on some additional medical resources uh, in the different hotels so we can have a greater presence and a greater ability to check on the people that are in the hotels. Um, I think the thing that's really important to remember, though, is that we're not setting up clinics in these hotels or hospital-like settings. They're still designed to be there to support individuals that just can't be home and are not sick enough to be in the hospital. Um, but again, as we've seen with this virus, this virus can suddenly change on somebody overnight. And those are the things that we need to be, make sure that we have the right resources in place to support them. Sure. Another audience question here, uh, how is the supply chain for PPE? Uh, someone writes, my firm has supplied 3M, N95, respirator masks for a number of organizations. Uh, but I guess the broad question, the PPE supply chain, any uh, information on that? And I can start out on the PPE, and I don't know if anybody else has anything else, but PPE has been a struggle from the beginning on this, right? So we've, we're experiencing a nationwide disaster, um, which means everybody across the nation, and it's a global disaster, is um, trying to get the same type of PPE to support their operations. And so we've done a number of things to help. Um, improve that um, from making our own, where we're making our own face masks here in Brooklyn. Uh, we're starting to make gowns. We had looked at ways to just create our own ventilators. And so coming up with creative ways to be able to augment the PPE supply that we have. Um, I know that there's been a number of people that have offered and say that they have PPE and there's a website that they can go to. I believe off the top of my head, it's www.nyc.gov backslash COVID suppliers. And if you um, want to be able to provide PPE, we're still looking for PPE, you can go through that website. And I'll add, we're starting to see a lot more uh, PPE make its way into local communities as well. I think starting uh, just this past weekend that the New York City Parks Department was also get, doing PPE giveaways. I am in uh, constant contact with a lot of my uh, local hospitals and clinics and they're starting to see much more sufficient uh, amounts of PPE making their way in. But uh, really, we're going to have to turn to ensuring that uh, our most vulnerable communities really are getting the PPE into their hands. So, um, you know, I know the governor has announced PPE going directly into NYCHA residents' hands, and, and we're going to have to make sure that the most vulnerable and hardest hit areas have a sufficient amount of it as we move forward. Okay, another audience question. This is for uh, First Deputy Commissioner Kavanaugh. You mentioned adapting the department for the future. The FDNY responds to far more medical calls and fires. I have to confirm if that's the case. Uh, yet its resources are geared toward firefighting. How are you considering reshaping the department to better organize for medical response in the future? This is a tremendous opportunity to improve the service delivery. So I think, as I mentioned on the front end of this call, you know, the, the fire department, the FDNY is really an all hazards emergency agency. And so we do do a tremendous amount of um, medical work in addition to fire suppression um, and a dozen other, other things. And so, you know, that's already something we do in any emergency. We think about how do we take all of our resources and allocate them towards the emergency at hand. And that is just as true. Uh, about a med medical emergencies as anything else. Um, you know, we have firefighters that are uh, trained with uh, CFR, which is a, a basic emergency medical certification. So we utilize all of our resources um, in any emergency, including a medical one. And that's really what we're set up to do and, and what our training is about. Sure. And there've been a, a few questions from the audience about just the prospect of reopening, whether we should, what that's going to look like. One question, um, 
I know mid-May, some places in New York might reopen. Do you think this will spike more positive tests of coronavirus? Or do you think it would be best to still be paused? Uh, any quick take on that? I, I, I don't want to answer everything, but <laughs> sure. um, I mean, largely data will drive a lot of the conversation. But, you know, I, I talked about a little bit earlier about uh, recovery and recovery. What does recovery look like? Does it mean recovery for Manhattan um, or does it mean recovery for the entire city? So they are going to have to be policies put in place. And that's why the concentration of resources, especially for the hardest hit communities, uh, needs to start to trickle into our communities because otherwise it becomes a recovery uh, for certain parts of New York City. But then a lot of uh, communities are left behind. We're going to, I'm already starting to see a lot of uh, rent signs up on certain parts of Southeast Queens already, you know, as I drive down the corridor, right? Um, so this recovery has to work for all. And we have to make sure that those resources are reaching the deepest pockets uh, of our city. So there's no easy answer. I mean, we're all learning, but I think we can look to Taiwan, um, places like Taiwan, certainly, who, who have gotten it right. Um, I think we'll have to start to look to new measures. You know, when you go to your restaurant, are you taking your temperature as you enter in? And I think there's a fine line between civil liberties and, and safety and wellness and health for everyone, right? So I, I don't know what the new norm will look like as we move forward, um, but I think New Yorkers should prepare themselves for it uh, as we talk about opening. Sure. Um, actually, to follow up another uh, kind of specific audience question, does the city plan to use body temperature scanners in public buildings? Mm -hmm. And we don't know at this point. Well, I, I can speak to the fire department. The fire department is doing that in our public spaces. Um, you know, because about 95% of our workforce still uh, has to show up for work, they're all essential employees. Um, we are doing temperature screening in EMS stations, firehouses, um, both PSACs, both 911 call centers, as well as at headquarters. Um, so that's definitely something that we have, have implemented across the board. Sure. And we are just about out of time. Uh, any final points? Any you want to make quick? Social distance. <laughs> Wear your mask. I was going to say the same thing, Council Member. <laughs> While it may be improving, we need New Yorkers to stay vigilant. Yeah, I think as I said a few minutes ago, you know, this is a human em emergency. Please remember that there are essential workers out there that have to come to work um, if there's another wave. So please remember that. Um, and as a result, wear your mask and social distance and stay home when you can. Okay, great. And I think I'll add one more point to that. Sorry, if I may, John. Certainly. Um, social distancing, wearing masks, it's all wonderful. Um, I think taking an educational standpoint for it, uh, do your research. Uh, there's a lot of misinformation out there. There's a lot of rumors and conspiracies. And I think taking the time to do the research and get to the truth of the matter is really important here as well. Great. Um, we are out of time. Thanks again to our sponsors, CDW and MCNY. Metropolitan College of New York is a nonprofit purpose-centered college committed to community and social justice. With two campuses, downtown in the Financial District and in the Bronx, MCNY offers undergraduate and graduate programs that give students the tools to make a positive difference in their lives, workplaces, and communities. Final note, we will be holding additional discussions in our series each week. Next week is a discussion on the impact on vulnerable populations. Uh, that'll be Tuesday, May 12th. We have the city's health commissioner, Dr. Oxiris Barbeau, the city's department for the aging commissioner, Lorraine Cortez Vasquez, the New York City Council member, Francisco Moya. Uh, plus, uh, looking ahead to June 2nd, we just locked in some uh, really stellar panelists on mental health. We'll have Anne Marie Sullivan, commissioner of the State Office of Mental Health, Susan Herman, director of Thrive NYC, and New York City Council member, Diana Ayala, chair of the Committee on Mental Health, Disabilities, and Addiction. Uh, thank you again to our audience for tuning in, and thanks, of course, to all of our panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Stay safe. And this concludes our program.